Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate you to the next level in your life. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Listen, Jesus said, followers fish for men. If you were here last week, great. So Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you a what? Fisher of men. Okay, so here's, here's a truth. If we're not fishing for men, then we're probably not following Jesus. Because it's not just about gathering information in order for us to have transformation. But God transforms us so that we there in return transform other people's lives. But the church has become so consumed with itself that all we want is the glory. All we want is a move of God, which I believe in those things. I want those things. But God wants us to take the glory and take it into the world and change lives. Because there's nothing more glorious. The greatest miracle is not a healing. The greatest miracle is salvation. It's salvation. And so this, the line snapped, and I started thinking, okay, I remember. I've had some old snap moments with people. For example, many of you have heard this story, but I love sharing this story because it's real. Okay, so I used to be an internal investigator, and so I had to work with a lot of cops, detectives, city attorneys, district attorneys. And, uh, I mean, I was passionate and really good at what I did. So, you know what, we just became good friends, a lot of cop friends. And so one of them became a really good friend of mine. And... Uh, I started doing ride-alongs with him a lot, and he'd pick me up after work, and we'd go take off, and, uh, and he ended up calling me, like, his canine. And uh, the reason he did that was because one day I was in the car with him, and while we were driving, I said, dude, 12 o'clock marijuana, I can smell it. He's like, come on. I'm like, dude, I know. I used to live it. And, um, and he says, no, well, we can't just pull him over because you're smelling something. I said, okay. Well, I'm like, well, can we do anything because I'm telling you. There's, they're, they're, they're doing some. And so he checks the license plate. Well, sure enough, the tags were already expired, whatever. So that was a, an opportunity to stop the vehicle. Well, stop the vehicle. He gets off. I have to stay in the car. Windows roll down. Smoke comes out. Marijuana. Right? And so that's where the name came in, canine. And, uh, and so I was like really good friends with all these cops and just loving on them, befriending them. But here's what sucks. So this one time, you know what, he and I, I'm always sharing the gospel with him, loving on him, just you know, being Jesus to him, right? <laughs> oh, so I thought. And, uh, and then he starts telling me about his grandma because he wasn't receiving Christ. He wasn't just, he wasn't, he wasn't getting hooked on, on, on what I was trying to do. And, and as we're talking, he says to me, he's like, yeah, well, you know, my grandma's like a saint, like an angel. And I said, really? I'm like, does she have Christ in her life? He's like, no, you know, she's not Jesus, but she's a good person. She's great. She's sweet. And so he's just like, you know, this is his grandma. He loves, you can tell that he is a grandma's boy. And he's talking and talking. I'm like, I'm like, well, I'm like, does she have Jesus? No. Like, well, guess what, bro? I'm like, listen, old people burn too. And he's like, what? I'm like, yeah, old people burn in hell too, man. They, you know, old people, they go to hell too. He's like, what? I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm like, doesn't, I'm like, you don't have Christ. You're going to hell. And he's like, what the, everybody say, oh, snap. Oh, yeah, that was a snap. You know what I'm saying? Because here I'm trying to reach him, and then I open my mouth, you know what I'm saying? You see, I've learned that people don't have an issue with God. People have an issue with Christians. Because they do, oh, snaps too many times. By their lifestyle, by their conversation, by the way they carry themselves, by the way they live. They, oh, snap all the time. But one of the things that I have learned is that though I'm always oh snapping, but God is faithful because with every snap, God knows how to hold it together. Look at Colossians 1.17. By the way, if you have our Elevate Church app, download it or open it up because our notes are there and we have fill-ins. Look what it says. He says, he is before what? All things. He's before all things. For example, you decided to come to church today. You know why? Because you decided to put him first before all things. And so when you go out of your way to reach people, you are being like God where he is first before anything because you have this desire to want to see what God wants to see and that's healing people, restoring people and bringing them into his relationship and salvation and it's the greatest miracle. And he says, and in him all things what? All things hold together. Hey, guys, please, everybody stop moving around. Too much movement. Stop it, guys. Distracting. That's another big thing the enemy does. Distract. But check this out. He says he holds all things together. And so though my line may snap, God's line never snaps. 
He is so good. He doesn't lose every single seed. Now, though I messed up with my good friend, let me tell you something. I believe that God will still use that seed to do something amazing. And so sometimes I think we refrain from fishing is because sometimes we have snaps and then we think, oh, I don't want to try that again. I don't want to do that again. But the truth is this, is that with every snap, you learn how to be better. You know what? I learned a big lesson that day that I need to bring three or four rods with me next time with different lines. So I have a four-pound test line, six-pound, eight-pound, 12-pound test because the more line I add, the heavier weight I have on my line, the bigger fish I'm going to catch. And so you have to realize that when we go fishing, man, listen, we have to be colorful. We have to be creative on how we present the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's all about presentation. When you fish, it's about presentation. The fish are smarter in this generation than ever before. I know that sounds funny, but they are. You know, because now, like, we'll cast certain things and they don't work anymore. And I start thinking, like, man, what is up with these fish? They're smart. Uh, uh, when I went fishing to create our hook video, uh, and, you know, you remember I, I caught three bass. But, but there's this one trout that was just right there five feet away from the boat. And I said, oh, my, get this little sucker. And I grabbed my little bait, my lure, and I put that on there and I threw it in there. I'm like, oh. And I was like working it, presentation, like, you know, just making it look all sexy and everything. And that fish was just kind of like looking at it, kind of like, yeah, whatever. You know, I'm like, oh, my God. So then I tried something else. I'm like, oh, and I'm like, oh, making it. Because you know what? Even when you work your rod, you can make it do cool things. Like, you know, like you can make it look like a dying fish and it's just like dying. And they love dying fish because it's like, oh, easy eat. Man, it didn't even like the dying fish move I had. And so it's just like, yeah, right, whatever, bro, never, ever. And, and, and I'm like, oh, my God, this is embarrassing. Here I'm throwing five feet away and it's just, you can see the water was clear in this location. And the fish would not bite. And I think sometimes we think that because we're sharing our faith and people aren't biting that I'm not making a difference. You're always making a difference when you open your mouth and you share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because we, we learned last week that the hook is the gospel. What's the gospel? It's, it's the, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you know what the bait is? Jesus. And so if the bait is Jesus, that means that the Jesus who lives in you becomes, number two, it becomes attractive. you got to be attractive when you are a Christian. For example, when I'm fishing, listen, I don't fish with the same lure all day long. i got to change the game because I know that it is a game changer when I have a variety. Ever say variety? When I have a variety of options. And you know what? I'm glad that God did not create a black and white world. He created a colorful world. It's all about being colorful. It's all about being creative. You know what? And guess what? When you fish, it's all about color too. You know what? They don't just go for lures and, and anchovies and worms. You know what? They go for power bait. And each one of these power baits, you know what, are attractive. Sometimes they feel like they want the white with the glitter. And sometimes, you know, you slap on your white and glitter, and they're like, not today, homie. And you're like, okay, that's all right. Because you know what, bam, I brought the green slime today. And they're just like, yeah, whatever, ain't happening. I don't want green slime. That's okay, because then... I can bring my favorite, which is the, the, the rainbow trout one. And this colorful one, man, I get a lot of luck with this baby right here. This right here is gold, okay. I average at least five fish when I, hit, when I use this, this stuff right here. But you know what? When that doesn't work, <laughs> oh, I'm going to bring it. I bring the scent. So it's not just, it's not just the, 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 the bait, but the bait has a scent. And you know what I start thinking about? I start thinking about, you know what, Christians also have a scent. And you either stank, stink, or you have a scent that's from heaven. Believers have a scent. People can smell whether or not you're good. People can literally see it. They can smell it. Think about it. I remember, you know what, one thing I've always liked about the Catholic church is that Frankenstein smell. You know, that when they come in there, they're like, oh, oh. what is it called? Okay, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and they bring the smoke. And, and, you know, but the scent does something to you. Like neurologically, it does something to you. And you know what it does? It almost begins to create this reverence. All of a sudden, you just feel so religious. 
You know, you just feel like, oh. And you even kind of go into, into Catholico, you know, uh, mode. You go into Catholic mode and you start doing like, what am I doing? What's wrong? You start, and you just start going back in. Why? Because there's something about the scent that creates this conviction that makes you think about God Almighty. Well, guess what? When you have the scent of heaven in your life, people start looking at you. They start wondering, what is it about you? There's a conviction in their life just because you walked into the room. There's a change that begins to happen. You become a game changer in your workplace, in your community, with your family. Even your family members who know your past will say, dang, what is it about you? I don't know what it is about you, but I want what's on you. There's a scent that comes from heaven that's in your life, and his name is Jesus. We need to have a scent. Because sometimes what you say is not enough, but what you live with the scent is more than enough. I broke my phone this last week. I know. It sucked. I was in Mexico, jacked it up, and it was funny. You know what was embarrassing? I didn't share this all day. But you know what? I, I was looking in that, you know, I had downtime. I was working like 12-hour days. And, uh, and I was on my Instagram. And I cracked my phone, and so it had like all these crazy things. As I opened it up, <laughs> there's some people posting like some weird, nasty stuff. You know, just weird stuff. And... Uh, and my thing, my phone just started liking everybody's stuff on its own. I'm like, no, a like, a like. I'm like, I don't think people are gonna think I'm, you know, crazy or something. Like, no. But anyways, uh, what was the point for that one? I don't even remember what the point was for that one. But you know what? Um, oh yeah, the scent. So check this out. So so then I'm at the Apple Store yesterday, and and you know what? I I was being uh, helped by this uh, this young lady, and and you know what? Um, I saw her working. Because she's helping me and like 20 other people. And I was in there for like three hours, four hours to buy a phone. And, uh, and so, but I'm watching her. And there's something about being a colorful person. And what I mean by being colorful, that means that, you know what, you, you're the kind of person that, uh, that is willing to do anything and everything just to make people feel right. For example, give me that next scripture with uh, 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 God becomes all things to all men, uh, that by any means he may win some, save some. Look at this, 1 Corinthians 9.22. This is the, the all things possible lore. says, I have become all things to what? All people. Man, wow, Paul became all things, not some things, not a few things. He says, man, you know what? I become all things that by any means. And I've done this so that in all possible ways I may what? But haven't you noticed that the church has become so self-seeking, self-centered, and so self-consumed with their own personal health life that we no longer make the gospel about reaching, but we've made the gospel more about us. I was doing this, this review. I went to like every major church out there, even small churches, and I started just going through all their podcasts to see what, what, what are the sermons that these people are preaching in churches. And you know what? I've noticed that every, just about every sermon is just about self-help. And you don't, you don't find any more sermons on soul winning. You just find people wanting to hear another message that's going to help them be successful. You just keep hearing sermons about how, now nothing wrong with those sermons. I say preach it. I preach it. I encourage. I empower. I stir hearts. I confront. Great. But, but where is the sending part of this? Because the first words of Jesus was, follow me and I'm going to make you a fisher of men. And so if we're following him, then we're fishing. But his last words, think about it, his first words in, in, in meeting his disciples, he said, let's go. I'm going to train you how to fish and how to reach and how to heal and how to restore. And then his last words, before he leaves this earth, he looks at his disciples one more time. He says, now go into all the world and preach the gospel. So his message was consistent. And how is it that the church has gone so far away from the very purpose of God? And that is to win souls, change lives transform people. God has placed you in a pond that changes lives. The reason I shared the story about the apple store is because I see this girl and she's like, 
she's like very colorful and, and she's able to, you know what, make the, the older people, like she was helping some, you know, older people probably about their 70s or 80s that are, you know, very lacking, in, you know, intelligence on, you know, social media and everything that, that is used with electronics. But she was just like so colorful and very patient. And I'm just like, wow, that's amazing. And I'm like, this girl's like bump. And then she goes to the young person and just kind of, but she's becoming all things with the older people. She's like talking older stuff. Like, yeah, she's only like 22 years old. She's like, yeah. And she's talking very like, you know, proficient, their language. And then the young just like, yo, what's up? You know, like going crazy. Hey. And it was like funny because she was very colorful. And then, you know, of course she comes to me. She's like, hey, how's it going? So she kind of knew that I'm a little bit more relaxed, but I'm fun. I'm exciting. And anyways, <laughs> And so, and so, so we're, so we're talking now and we're like that. And so, of course, I'm going to be like, you know what, asking the craziest questions. And I did, I said, hey, listen, I know this is probably going to sound weird, you know, and I'm wondering probably what she's thinking I'm going to ask her. I said, I'm going to ask you something that's going to be kind of weird, but I've been watching you. I'm like, man, and you, you have a gift. I'm like, you're very good with making people feel comfortable. I said, you're a great communicator and you know how to make people feel like they're the most important thing on planet earth. I'm like. I'm just going to be honest. I'm like, are you a Christian? She's like, oh, my God, yeah. I'm like, oh, it makes, it makes total sense. And, and she's like, yeah, I just want to make people feel happy. I'm like, yeah, I get it. And so we're just like talking about Jesus. And, like, <laughs> and yeah, it's like amazing, right? And I'm just thinking, wow. You know what? She's not, she's not in full-time ministry. She's an employee at Apple Store and just making people feel like they're important. And then she walks around with a scent. That was so attractive that I said, are you a believer by any chance? Are you a Christian? And, and so I'm telling you, there should be something around you when you're walking that says, oh, dude, you got to be a Christian. There's got to be something about you. If you don't have that kind of scent, go get it. And that scent only comes when you spend time with God. That scent only comes when you follow Jesus. You know what? He's the only one that can add that scent on your life. It's not that difficult. It's not that you're going to create it. It's that as you go, he says, I will make you a scent. Have you ever been in an elevator? <laughs> and then they, someone walks in and it's either like, wow, that smells so good. Oh, my God. Wow. And you just, you just want to be around them, just walk with them, right, because of the smell. And then you have that other person who's got like 10 colognes or 10 perfumes on. And it's just like, oh, my God, help me. You know, Lord. But that's how some Christians are, man. They just stink. You know what? They stink in their kindness. They stink in their consistency. They stink in, in their love and compassion in their generosity, they just stink. They're just, just self-consumed, and they're not life givers. They're those kind of Christians. Listen, as I said earlier, it's not the world does not have an issue with God. The world has an issue with Christians. Christians ruin it. As a matter of fact, you know that there is actually there's a bait called stank. And you know what stank does? You know what that bait does? I love this bait because you know what? I've caught some big catfish on stank. And you know why? Because it has a stank odor, man. It stinks. But you know why it attracts them? Because catfish are bottom feeders. So I have to become all things to all fish that by any means I may catch one, right? And so I bring the stank on and I throw my stank in there and it attracts. There's a scent on the stank that brings them and that hooks them and that we begin to reel them in. And so the question is, is, that, is this, are you drawing closer uh, drawing people closer to God or are you drawing people further away from God? Because you're all doing it intentionally either way. So you might as well do it with the intention to draw them in to God. And how do I do that? Well, I have to be colorful. I have to, I have to, it's not just about how much Bible knowledge you have. I know people that know the Bible real well and they don't do nothing for God. They can just quote you verses and give you revelations and ooh. And, but, man, when was the last time you want a soul? When did you reach someone? Tell me how many lives have you changed with that information. You know what I'm saying? It's not just about coming to church. That is boring. If you just come to church, if you just read your Bible, if you just pray and you do nothing else, I'm telling you, you're dying slowly spiritually. You will not be consistent. You will be inconsistent 
consistently because there is no life. Life comes when you follow Christ and following Christ means that I go fishing. Can we get an amen? amen. Cool. Can I give you another verse? Man, someone turn off your phone. That was weird. Hey, can, can I be honest with you? Listen, don't, don't, don't be bothered with people's doubts. I think the moment you, you hear people like, well, I doubt God, you're just like, oh, okay, great. No, doubts are awesome. You know, Jesus didn't have a problem with doubts. I mean, let's just take two stories. Let's just start with Thomas. Thomas was known as what? Doubting Thomas. He doubted. He's rolling with Jesus and he's still doubting like, man, are you for real? It's like, I'm in front of you. Dude, you saw me on the cross. I'm right here now. Hello. Are you sure? Can I just put my finger through your holes in your hands and in your side and because I saw there, you know, let me see that hole again. Mm, are you sure? You sure that ain't an illusion? You know, you know, I mean, he doubted, but let me tell you something. You can't have faith without doubts. Because faith is the only thing that can bring you back out of doubt. So doubt is not a bad thing, guys. If people say, man, I doubt that. I don't, you know what? You just say this, that looks, this looks like a job like for me to do something and change the, the bait and the lure. And I'm going to do something that's going to be amazing. That's going to make them. For example, you know what? This, this, uh, this last week we had two girls come, young girls in our youth ministry. And, and I think it was you that came up to me and said, hey, Pastor, I got these two girls. They're crying and they just they wanted you to know that her, their mom is, is dealing with cancer and, and tumors. And, and she's about to have uh, or she was having surgery or about to have surgery. She already had one surgery, and it wasn't looking good. It was looking bad, and they're crying. And I said, okay, fine. And this is during worship. I'm up here, and I said, bring the girls to me. And so they came up here, and they're crying. And I said, okay. I said, do you believe? And, of course, they didn't believe. They were doubting it at first. They were just crying, scared. But I said, this looks like an opportunity for Jesus to do something amazing. And I said, okay. I said, you just stay here. I'm like, do you believe that God can do it? Because I believe God can do it, but, but do you believe? And they're just like, eh. I'm like, yeah, no, yeah. I'm like, okay. Do you believe that if we pray as a church, that God's gonna move on your mom's behalf? Eh, eh. And so we we so we got together, and then and then we went ahead and I and I stopped the uh, worship. I think it was during worship, and I just said, okay, church, here's what we're gonna do, is we have a a, a lady right now. This these two young girls' mom is in the hospital right now dealing with cancer. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to pray as if it was your family. And, and so we all got together as a church, and we started praying for these two young girls. And let me tell you something. You can, you can sense that there was a move of God that was taking place um, in this church. And, and let me tell you something. Um, that was last week on a Wednesday night or the week before on a Wednesday night when this happened. And it was not looking good. And we just followed up, checked up on the family. How are you doing? We're praying. We're standing, believing. And guess what? Put that picture up, brother man. Look at this. That is her this morning at 8 a.m. service. Right here at Elevate Church. And you know what? And there's the two young girls, the one next to me and then the girl right there the, with the Raiders. Help her, pray for her father. Just, <laughs> um, and then Vanessa, she's also a, a, a sister, sibling with them. But let me tell you something. You know what happened? See, the first thing is presentation. How do you present the gospel in your life? Second thing is attraction. What's the attraction? You know what the attraction was for these girls? That we all came together as a church. This had nothing to do with me. It had everything to do with us as a team. And we all prayed together in that church service. And that became so attractive that, you know what? These girls now, they came with mom and said, mom, we're going to church. Mom said, yes, I'm going to church. And mom said, now, you know what? I'm going to keep coming to church. And I said, yeah, girl, because right now you may be in that wheelchair, but you're going to come out of that wheelchair and you're going to go fishing. And so just remember this, is that once you have that attraction, then you have a reaction. And then people make decisions. And when they make decisions, they follow Christ because you presented it right. Amen. Isn't that exciting? Doesn't it just make you want to go out right now and just win the world? Thank you, thank you for your enthusiasm. We become all things. Everybody say all things in all possible ways. That's how we got to think. We got to be a people that are all possible ways. Here's why. Why do you teach us this? We teach this every year at least two, three times a year. Why do you teach this? It hurts me that I'm not hearing this in churches anymore. Why do we teach this? 
because Satan fishes too. He's always fishing, guys. You know what? He's not just fishing for people that are far away from God. He's fishing for you and me too. You know what? He works it too. He also has a fishing rod. He also thinks it's sexy when he hears this. He loves that. And you know what he does? He looks for people that are vulnerable, that are going through stuff. He looks for people that are drawing back. You know what? When you're, when you're feeling like you're, you're just like uh, mundane, stagnant, that's the worst time to stay there. When you're at that point of just feeling just like this, ah, that's the time where you got to press in all the more because the enemy looks at, at that as an opportunity to say, oh, I'm coming in because they're vulnerable right now. And you know what they do? The enemy, he, he, he's not stupid either. He's very colorful. And you know what? And he uses different bait and he uses different bait because he knows that, you know what, there's certain bait called sin that doesn't attract me, but it may attract you. So he knows what you're attracted to. And so there's that bait of lust. So if you're constantly dealing with lust, you know what? He's always just finding that moment because he knows that lust is going to get you. And then he just brings it. And then he written you. At first you're like, no, 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 no. And then he says, okay. And he says, okay, I'm going to have to go ahead. I'm going to have to cast a little bit further. And then he brings it. And then there's that, there's that, 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 that sin of pride. Ah, they think they got it all together. Oh, yeah. They think that, man, they're the bomb.com and all those things. And, yeah, I don't need God. I don't need the church. I don't need. Okay, oh, yeah, let's work him. Let's work her. And then he begins to come in. And then there's that pride of, uh, uh, I mean, that sin of, of like, of, uh, it could be theft. It could be a, a lack of forgiveness. And so he'll always bait you in and he'll work you and he'll work you until one day you get hooked. You see, remember last week I said, Satan he is a caster of disaster. He will cast to create a disaster in your life and my life. That's what he does. And there's two types of fishing, guys. And there's, there's, there's this terminology call, called, are you, uh, are, you, are, are, you, are you just doing game? Game means catch and release. Are you doing game? Yeah, I'm uh, game. Or, or they just say, hey, are you doing keep? Yeah, I'm just doing keep. That means I keep them, fry them, eat them. Adios. Well, Satan, Satan. He plays to keep. And you know what he does is as Satan is luring you with different things, you know what? He'll, he'll change up the game too on you. He'll, cha he'll use different ones. He's going to go ahead and, and try different things because he knows that, you know what, maybe this is too small for him or her. So let's bring the big dog out. Whoa, right? And then all of a sudden it just becomes so attractive that the enemy comes and then eventually just grips you and takes you. And then you know what he does? He has his little, his little wall. And, and it's basically, it's his trophy wall. Because remember, he is a catch and he ain't releasing. And then so you know what he does? He, he then goes ahead and he starts putting all of his trophies on his wall. And, and, and each trophy has a different story. You have, this, this was the lure of lust. This was the lure of of pride, this was the lure of distraction. How many know that distraction is a sin? When you're distracted with solely your purpose, you're sin. I think when we think sin, we think adultery. We think pornography. We think all the big dogs. But when you're distracted from God's purpose in your life, you're sinning. And there's different kinds of distraction. There's the distraction of success. Because you know what? We love success. Success is not a bad thing. But you know what? It is when you're chasing it. You're chasing it. And you're just like, and then eventually, boom. And the enemy gives it to you. And it tastes good. And it smells good. And you know what? And yes, it will give you a little some, some. But that same distraction will also kill you. You can be distracted with, you know what? Not reading your Bible. You can be distracted with not praying anymore. You can be distracted by not coming to church. You know what? There's a new statistic now in America. The average Christian only attends one service a month. One church service. One. One. Why? Because they're distracted. They're not following 
They're distracted with, whether you're distracted with, 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 with uh, problems, you can be distracted with problems. Jesus has a, 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 a healing for that. He says, stop worrying about today. Let, let, let today worry about itself or, or worrying about tomorrow. Let today worry about itself. And so God is constantly saying, stop being distracted about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. What... I've heard people say, Pastor, you know what, man, it's, it's, it's eat or come to church. I got to go work. I'm like, okay, so then your work has become your God. I, I, I listen, oh, you just say that because you're a pastor. No, I've been in the workforce. I, and I get it. You have to honor your job. But do you know what? But I also can pray for my job. I can also pray for my boss, the one who said you'll never have Sundays off again. You will never. There's no way. In this company, there is no Sundays off. Well, guess what? I have such a, a passion for my God. I have so much faith for my God that I pray, God, would you, Lord, I, would you just change his heart, change whoever's heart is in corporate office and give me my Sundays, God, because I want to serve you. I want to love you. And guess what? I'll never forget the day when they went on VCon, what we call VCon in those days, which is basically FaceTime. And right there, the, the owners of one of the biggest electronic companies in America said, we have come to a conclusion that we feel that all managers deserve Sundays off. Are you hearing me? Satan is the caster of disaster and he uses a lot of distractions. Watch out for those distractions because they're luring you away and luring you away and before you know it, you're gone. Don't be a stat on his trophy wall. Don't do that. It's not worth it. Check this out. Let me give you another verse real quick. Look, Romans 3.23 says this, because we also have to be, be like legit and real. I, this is something I'm annoyed by Christians. In Romans 3.23 says, for all, everybody say all. Okay, you got to learn how to talk to people that are far away from God. Because if not, you just think that you're just this person that just feels like they've arrived. And guess what? No, you haven't. No, I haven't arrived. You haven't arrived. He says, for all have sinned and fall short. Everybody say fall short. Come on, we're all shorty. We all fall short of the glory of God. And so all have sinned. So you know what I do now when I talk to people, I just say, hey, listen. They're like, you know what, I'm just not ready because you know what, I'm not ready to change. And, you know, I'll change first, then I'll come to God. I'm like, you know what, bro, here's the truth. You know what, you're a sinner, I'm a sinner. And I hear this stupid thing and in, 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 it's been an argument in church forever. Here's the truth, man. We're all sinners. No, we're not. We're covered by the blood of Jesus. Glory to God. No, no. Stop your doctrine. We have all sinned. You know what? Let me spend some time with you and trust me. I can dig and see what your sin may be. It could be a lack of obedience of your tithing. That's a sin. It can be a lack of obedience of, of, of you sharing your faith with people that are far away. God has told you over and over again, go reach that person. Go, and you're not doing it. That's sin. It can be distraction. You're constantly distracted with dumb when God's trying to give you something that's his plan, but you're distracted by your plans instead of God's perfect plan. See, there is a permissible will, but there's also a perfect will. We all hit that area. We have all sinned. To say, I'm not a sinner is to say, I never sin. Liar. Yes, you do. And so do I. We all fall short of his glory. But thank God that I have a savior who can always bring me back when I miss it. And we all miss it, but Jesus never missed it. He nailed it once and for all. Amen. And so let's not be dumb and say things like, oh, I don't see. You know what? You'll never win people. People will always think that, man, I, I, I don't have what it takes to follow this God because I have to be perfect. No. You know what? We serve a perfect God and he's for imperfect people, but he knows how to perfect you. And when you experience his ultimate love, you know what happens? Is that his authentic, genuine, real love compels you to want to stop sinning. You see, he doesn't make me stop. He compels me with his love to stop. I no longer have to feel like I'm being made to do something. His love just, I just want to do good. I want to be right with him because he's so faithful and he's so gracious and so merciful. Why do I want to keep living that life when he keeps being so good to me, even when I don't deserve it? When you talk to people like that, 
now you're attracted. They're like, man, I want to know your God. Because it's not religion that's saving. Religion is killing. Relationship is healing. And his name is Jesus. Are you hearing me today? Look at Isaiah 59 verse 2. Look, Isaiah 59 verse 2 says, but your sins have separated you from your God. Come on, have you ever been in a place where you have separated yourself from God? Be honest. How many here would say, I have had moments where I, I have separated from God for a little bit as a Christian. Lift your hand, be honest. Don't lie in church. You'll go to hell. Just kidding. No, I'm just playing. No, but it's true. Listen, we've all had a moment where, you know, you got a little, hmm, you, 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 hmm. Well, that's a sin. Well, you mean, you mean not pursuing God's sin? Yes. Yes. Because he says in Hebrews eleven six 6, that, that, that if you believe in him, he who comes to him must believe that he is God. We must. And he says, but your sins have separated you from your God. They have caused him to turn his face away from you so he won't even listen to you. I'm telling you, Jesus never said that fishing would be easy, guys. But one thing I have learned too is that fishing has taught me patience. That's, how I, that's why I started fishing actually. I'm naturally impatient. I know what I want. And so that's, that's been my challenge. And that's a sin too. Because God wants me to rest and not be restless. And so, um, but I also think that it's a gift because I'm a doer. <laughs> I don't just talk, I do. And so it's like how do you come to a, a very balanced place of resting but still doing and being, ah. Uh. And so as I started learning about fishing, I learned that, Mauricio, it's not 100% sure that you're going to catch anything just because you're going fishing. There's been times where I just skunk. Hey, man, did you catch any? Eh. Skunk, bro. Oh, man, that sucks. How about you? Yeah, I got five. Oh, you suck. And, you know, it's just like. But, but check this out. But your sins have separated you from your God. You see, I used to work at a place called Alpha Beta. You guys, how many remember Alpha Beta? All right, that just shows you your age. Okay. We're all old, man. We're getting old, praise God. Yeah, well, I used to work at Alpha Beta. I was a bag boy. How many remember Lucky's? Anybody remember Lucky's? Remember Lucky's? Dang, Lucky. You're really old if you remember Lucky's. And so we know who took them over, Ralph's. Ralph's bought out Alpha Beta, brought out Lucky, and then Ralph's just took the game. And so I used to work at Alpha Beta, and in that time I was an atheist, and I said, there is no God. That's so stupid. And I would just want to thrash every Christian or I don't care any religion. I just didn't like you. There was a guy who I worked with, and he reminds me of what I do when I fish. You know what? This is one of my chairs that I fish with. And when I go fishing, you know what? I already know I bring a chair because... I know that I have to be patient because it may take 30 minutes. It may take four hours. It may take 10 hours before I catch the fish. So I want to chill too. And I'm not just going to be sit, just be standing the whole time like all freaked out and everything. No, I cast my, cast my line, throw it in there, whatever I'm using. And then I'm just like filling it periodically, just like, okay, just waiting for the nibble. And so this man, Larry, he was very smart because you know what? He, he would constantly cast his lure towards me. And he was very smart because he never used the same thing. He was so smart that he would find things that would probably attract me so that he can get a reaction. And so what he did is whenever I would come and talk to him about maybe a disappointing experience or maybe a, a challenge at, at home or whatever, he would always tell me, hey, Mauricio, you know what? He would first encourage me and he wouldn't bring all these Bible verses like, well, God says, praise God, that it, he didn't do that. People don't, they don't, that's not attractive. I don't even know the Bibles. Why are you going to start quoting scripture to me? But you know what he did? He used the scripture and turned it into his language. And without me knowing, he was actually quoting scripture. But he made it so relevant that he would encourage me and he would try. And I promise you, uh, did he hook me? Nope. <laughs> 
but I listened. And I was like, okay. And then let's say I had a cold, the flu or something, and he saw me sick, not feeling well. He'd be like, hey, man, you all right? I'm like, yeah, I'm just not feeling good, man. He's like, dude, let me pray for him. I'm like, oh. But because he was a friend, I just said, all right, dude, hurry up, man, pray. And he's just like, he's praying, like, all right, yeah, in Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, whatever, yeah, dude, bye. And then he'd walk up, I'm like, man, what a weirdo, dude. And then he would try another lure. And so if I was going through a financial struggle, if I was going through challenges at work, whatever it was, he always kept casting. And every month he would do the same thing. Because let me tell you something. You and I live in a world where everyone has problems. Everyone. I don't care if you have, if you have all the money in the world or have nothing. Everyone has problems. And this man would fish. You know what? He did this for two years straight every month would never stop inviting me to church would never stop offering me prayer would never stop uh, uh, giving me encouragement empowerment this man was consistent this man was not a man with a platform this man was not a man who who was you know leading thousands or even hundreds this was just a man who was a cashier at Alpha Beta who, who was a clerk and who was, you know what, finalizing the sales as they were going. But as he was there, he kept casting his line towards me constantly until one day, you know what, my daughter was born. Oh, not this daughter. <laughs> Alexis, you're not my daughter. I'm not your daddy. That was wrong. That was, my daughter's been playing all day, that's why. You guys ruined my whole, my whole everything. Now just, you guys just like, now I lost my whole train of thought. But anyways, my daughter was dying, Alexis, and I was in the hospital. And I, but see, but I remembered, I remember every single cast that Larry made. And then I said, hey, Larry, uh, if, if your God is who you say your God is, then you tell your God to heal my daughter. And I'll believe, and you know what he did? He brought out the big dog. He brought out the miracle lure. And so he said, okay. He's like, listen, I believe that my God can heal your daughter, blah, blah, blah. And he says, I'll come. And he came and he laid hands on my daughter. And he was praying for her. All the doctors, nurses thought he was weird because they were telling him, you're bringing him false what? Hope. And he just prayed and he said, so the doctors come, no, it's not looking good. He'd be like, no, your daughter's going to live and not die. And she's going to declare the works of the Lord. And your daughter's going to have a future with hope. And your daughter's going to be this and that. And I'd be like, whoa. And so he was fishing. I was like, uh, uh, and just taking it. And then sure enough, 48 hours later, yeah, there was a change. My daughter was healed and it was amazing. And guess what? This is a man who worked in a grocery store. And 30 years later, he's still working at Ralph's. Putting milk in the refrigerator. Restocking all the aisles with food. Still finalizing the sales at the register. Still being an employee for an employer, but he's constantly casting his line and winning souls. Think about this. If there, if there wasn't a Larry, there would have never been an Alexis, my daughter who now sings and worships God and leads people into his glory. If there wasn't a Larry, there wouldn't be a Mauricio who is now living out his call. If it wasn't for Larry, guys, none of us right now would be sitting in this room experiencing God like we do every single week, worshiping God, experiencing his healing. You know what? There wouldn't be a Maggie who came in this morning at 8 a.m. thanking God because he saved her life from this horrible disease called cancer. Yes, she's still going through her process, but because there was a Larry, just a simple man who's working at Ralph's 30 plus years later, still doing the same thing, casting his line. Guess what? Can you imagine? Imagine what, what the crown of the man who led Billy Graham to Jesus Christ. Can you imagine the millions and millions and millions of souls that Billy Graham has won, but all because of the obedience of one man who was willing to just share his faith and share the fishing story with him and Jesus. And then Billy Graham got touched and he got hooked. And then all of a sudden, Billy Graham has been one of the greatest evangelists, evangelists of, of all history in America and has changed so many lives but all because of one man who was willing to go fishing. 
when you and I end this life, God is not going to look at your, at, your, at your resume and say, wow, what a wonderful this, what a wonderful banker, what a wonderful actor, what a wonderful pastor, what a wonderful whatever. He's going to say, Mauricio, did you fish? That's it. Did you fish? And I'll be like, yeah, God. You see, Larry, when we're in heaven, he will not be standing behind me just because I was a pastor in this church. I'll actually be standing behind Larry because I'll be one of the ones he fished. He took me off of Satan's trophy wall and he brought me into God's kingdom. If today's message impacted you in any way and you would like to help us spread the gospel to others by giving a financial gift, please text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed as yours was today.